Good morning, South Point. Did you bring a praise with you? Come on, let's worship Jesus. Nobody like him. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, the treasures that fade, I never
take communion. The ushers are going to come and pass the elements down your row. Please be aware that there are two cups on top of each other. Please make sure you grab both of them. If you are not a follower of Christ, meaning that you're not a Christian, uh, we're so glad that you're here. This part of the service are for those who are disciples of Christ. So when the elements come to you, you can just pass it to the person next to you. We're going to wait and take those together with Pastor Russ. But until then, we have every bit of reason to worship him. He's worthy of it all because of his sacrifice. Amen, church. Amen, church. Amen. Let's sing this together. that song Amen. you know we're going to talk today in a few minutes about serving as a way of life what that means I just want you to know before we take these elements together you were saved by an act of serving the father turned to the son and said you've got to go I'm sending you to save mankind the Bible tells us that he got up took off his royal robes laid him on his throne came down, put on human flesh to serve you and I. Jesus himself, as you'll see in a minute, said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he served us with his very life that we might be saved. And because of that, he's worthy of everything we've got this morning. Worthy of all our time, worthy of all our talent, worthy of all our worship, worthy of all our praise. And everybody said? Amen. So we remember that this morning. You are holding in your hands an act of service giving of his body, the shedding of his blood, that you might have eternal life. Serving made you saved. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you this morning for Jesus, for his obedience, for his coming, for taking on himself the form of a servant, to offer his life for mine, for ours, that we might have life in you. 
So we remember his death on our behalf until he comes again by remembering his body and his shed blood. Let's take together first of the cup of the bread and then of the juice. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? Hallelujah. Lift both your hands while the things are going by to collect the cups. He's worthy of it all. Worthy of it all. Are you ready now to, if you haven't praised him yet, you got a chance to praise him now. He's worthy of everything you got. So Lord God, we lift our hands, we lift our voices to praise and give you glory. Let's sing together. sacrifice. Thank you for your service. We love you and we worship you. And all his children said, amen. 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 Yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. Give him praise. Amen. You may be seated. Please give your attention to the screens.
They love to come to church. Every time Saturday rolls around, they're asking us, are we going to church tomorrow? And before, that was not the case. So because of you, our kids have a much better foundation than they would if, if they weren't here. It is such a comfort that the church wants our kids to grow in Jesus the same way that my husband and I want our kids to grow in Jesus. I've come in and seen my son just diving into the Word of God on his own. It's allowed us to have our experience in church, knowing that you know, he's safe back here in this environment, also learning the same thing that we are, and so we can also just share our experiences. And the volunteers that are there, I mean, they, they give a lot. And I know it's, I mean, for our family, it, it's one of the reasons why we decided to come to South Point in the beginning. Because of you, our children love coming to church and being a part of this wonderful family. Because of you, our son knows Jesus and he loves Jesus and that's all I could really ask for. Thank you. Thank you for pouring into them and um, just loving them. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for investing in our children. Thank you. About somewhere in the last year, uh, Pastor Aaron and Rachel, uh, Pastor Aaron leads a college and a YP, he's a teaching pastor here and does a number of other things, helps lead the church. And, um, but they said, you know, let's, let's take a different look at our older part of the CE group and um, Christian education, our children across the way, not the youth or the middle school, but under that. And um, let's upgrade it, and they found uh, some amazing material, but in order to do the material well and to do it right, it would involve tons of parents, more than normal. And, um, <clears throat> and so they uh, got a bunch of parents involved. You saw a lot of them on the screen. There's actually a lot more. You can't put everybody in a video. And, uh, but if you go back there, the worship, the teaching, the preparation, what goes into it, what our kids are getting on Sunday mornings right now in my opinion, second to none. Amen. It is quality stuff. And, um, and I so, so, so appreciate all the people that are putting their time into that to get that done. I appreciate the vision that uh, Pastor Aaron and Rachel had for that. And, um, uh, and it has really made a difference. And there's a lot of people. There's a lot of work that goes into every service to, to make that happen. It's like a little church service for children. And the worship and the teaching and they break out into groups and there's just all these things that they do. It's so powerful and I'm so happy because if we're going to win this war for children, we can't just kind of go, hey, that's bad. We have to do something good. Yeah, amen. amen. We got to get something built into their foundation, into their lives early because the world's starting that early. And so we got to start that early amen. too. And everybody said, amen. you're going to help each other out because we have a lot of people on the summer break. Has anybody noticed? And uh, so you're going you're gonna to yell around the room and yell, and we're just going to be family in a big living room this morning. And everybody said, Amen. yeah, just help each other out. All right, so this, this message today I call Serving as a Way of Life. It's, it's something I haven't done in years. But coming out of the pandemic, the world has changed in a lot of ways. And some of the things are, is a picked up mentality that's happened um, that's kind of just kept going. It, it didn't stop. It's like you came out of the pandemic, everybody's disengaged, not involved, uh, and then came back, disengaged and not involved. And, uh, and I think we have to pick up by maybe a little bit of a stirring with the Word of God and, and some thoughts from me as a pastor, a lead pastor here at the church that I think will help us. So I wrote a paragraph and probably went through the thing about 10 times because I wanted to make sure that that it said the context of why I'm saying what I'm saying this morning. Because if you don't get this, if you've been in church all your life, you've heard a message on serving or being asked to do things. We are going to do that, but there's a lot more to this message. But you'll put yourself right in that zone of, oh yeah, I know what this is, and you don't. The way I'm going to go at this is different, and uh, has mu it's, it transcends trying to fill a few empty spots because we, don't, we actually don't have empty spots. We always need more people to work for Jesus. Amen? Here's why. 
why serving is essential, all right? Read this paragraph with me. We'll put it on the screen for you. There is a point in the life of every follower of Jesus when they feel the need to yield a fair and just portion, a fair and just portion of their discretionary time to using their gifts and abilities to build the church and extend its reach into the world. When this time comes, the decisions they make have much to do with their growth in grace and in <clears throat> an increase of their knowledge of God. <clears throat> Every follower of Jesus will evolve into a servant of Jesus. To not become a servant of Jesus is to essentially stop following Jesus. Serving is not about something we do at the church. It's about who we become. Right. Now, just leave that up there for a second for me. All right, key, key things in there. Growth in grace. When we say grow in grace, it means a ton of things. All right, it's, you see it many times when Paul's starting a letter that you grow in grace and the knowledge of God. They're all through it, grow in grace. What in the world does that mean, grow in grace? And because uh, there's these little cheap definitions of grace, and then there's the grander one where grace means the whole picture of the gospel and the faith. So you're growing in all that God has to offer, growing in all that God is, and becoming the person that he's called you to be. That's what it means to grow in grace. So if you're going to grow in grace and you're going to grow in your knowledge of God, there's going to come a point where God's going to lay his hand on you, speak to you, and go, serve here, serve there, do this, and you're going to have a decision to make. And what you decide in that moment will deeply determine the pace of growth or growth at all in the grace and knowledge of God. Yeah. That's what I'm saying this morning. And that's what I'm talking about. All right? All right. Now, at some point, if you grow in grace, as a servant of the Lord, you're going to serve his church. You're going to serve his people. You're going to serve the family that you're in. You're going to serve the world that he's trying to reach. You're going to be a servant. You're just going to serve. The term and thought of serving is taught in, I don't know of any church that has any kind of like membership or what it means to be a part of the church or uh, that doesn't have serving in it now. Uh, it, it is always there because serving isn't just a set of job descriptions to help a church do well. It's how people grow. It's how they grow. You'll see it as we go along here today. I just went up because somebody ran over to me, or Jason, I think it was, said there's 20 people in the grow track after the first service. I said, 20 after the first service? So I ran upstairs. Sure enough, there was 20 people in there. And, um, and in our grow track, one of them on uh, is four classes that all of you should go through, even if you've been here 100 years, you should go through it. And, um, and the, one of them is build, the word build. And in that one, we talk about serving, what it means to serve the church at South Point, how you can, how you figure that out. Um, in the Purple Book, we use the Purple Book as a source of uh, a way to disciple people many times here. That's uh, in the spiritual family and church life, lesson two, it talks about that. Um, in uh, Wolfgang Eklebens, or Wolfie as we know him, the pastor in London that we all know, and uh, he's written three books called The Follow Course that their people go through to grow as members of the church. And uh, I, so I went and got his because I have them. And I found his on service in Living the Fruitful Life. Um, in the four E's, for those of you, I know a lot of you are going, I don't know any of these things. It doesn't matter. There's some of you that have been around. You know we use these different things. In the four E's, the words equip and empower are about serving. There's about getting involved, getting engaged with what God has for you to do. Everybody say do. You got to do something. So to be like Jesus, if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to become a servant. You're going to have the heart of a servant. If to become like Jesus, now listen to me, to become like Jesus, which we should all be wanting to become. That means that we will have the heart of a servant. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. You can look on the screens. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, <coughs> and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, here it is, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came as a servant to give something. He came to give his life for you, to serve you with salvation, with a way to be born again. It was his serving that saved you. 
All right, very important. John chapter 12 says something very similar in verses 23 through 26. But verse 26 is very important to us this morning. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground or into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So this is right before his crucifixion that he's speaking. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now here it is. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. In other words, God is going, what I'm doing, my servant will be doing. They'll be right there with me. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So if you follow Jesus, you'll be with him. If you're with him, you'll be serving. You'll be doing what he's doing. So if God is reaching people, you're reaching people. If God is making disciples of people, you're making disciples of people. If God is loving people, you're loving. You get it, right? If you're with, you serve. You serve with your life. Your life is service. All right? Now, I can frame what I want to say about serving, the beginning part of it, by using three words that just make it easy because they all rhyme. So I, I want to use these three words, altitude, aptitude, and altitude, all right? And, uh, and, and, and so you never want to turn those into a platitude, just for fun, all right? And I just forget I said that. All right, so, <clears throat> so altitude, or attitude, thank you. And uh, for people who heard this sermon in the first service are keeping me on track. So attitude, <laughs> and attitude is a mindset and, uh, and, and a temperament. That's what an attitude is. You know, she's got an attitude. Or, you, you, young man, you better change your attitude. You know, no parents ever said that. And, uh, you know, young lady, you better get that attitude straight. We all know what that means. And every parent said, Amen. yeah. It didn't work, but you, you got to keep trying. And uh, it's, it's just what we're called to do. So, it, it's, so an attitude is a mindset. It, it's, a, it's a temperament. It's, it's what the motive and energy or emotion that you bring to the party. So you can come to the party, and you don't want to be there, and then you emanate the absolute boredom, and you just ruin the party. Or you come to the party with a great attitude, so glad we're having a party, and I'm coming here to make it better. Great. All right? So serving, first of all, has to have the right attitude. you got to be there for the right reason. Yeah. Serving's not about duty. Now, we do have a duty to do, right? We have certain things we're supposed to do. Now, I'm going to say this, and you're going, aren't they the same thing? They're not. Serving is not about your duty, what you have to do. Serving is about obedience. Yes, right. Amen. Amen. It's about obedience. You're going, aren't they the same thing? I don't think they are. Duty is driven by guilt. Obedience is driven by love. Come on. It's like he, he said, go do this. And I'm going, is that my duty? I don't care. He wants me to do it. So I don't feel like it's, I, I'm so glad to do something for him that I will do it. It's different. It's, obedience is different than duty. It sounds the same, but it's different. And serving is obedience. And there comes a point in every believer's life where God puts his hand on you and goes, I want you to do this. I, I want you to do this. All right. Now, this is important because you don't always get to choose what you want to do. And this is where it gets rough. You know, like people go, yeah, man, I'm, I'm with you, Russ, because I can, this is what I can bring to the game. I get this all the time, and, I, and it's actually good. I don't think it's wrong. But they go, hey, I've done this all my life, or I'm good at this, or this is what I've always done at work, or this is what I got in my education, or here's my experience in church for the 30 years I've been in church. or You know, they have these things and go, I'm good at this, so I can help there. And you know what? You might be right, but I've seen many times God going, well, no, I have these other things that we need to do. We already got somebody doing that, so you do this. You don't always get to do what you want to do. I was raised in a generation, you don't hear this anymore, because we're always supposed to feel good now. <laughs> my generation didn't think you were supposed to feel good all the time. In fact, my generation kind of thought when you didn't feel good, you might be on the right track. That's right. <laughs> you know, they actually thought about things like the flesh, and it was in the Civil War with the Spirit. We were taught things like that. I know we don't believe in that anymore, but it's still Scripture. And, uh, and so we were taught, sometimes when you don't feel right, it might be you that's wrong. And so we were taught that. So we were taught this old line. Anybody remember this line that's been in church all your life? Find a need and fill it. Yeah. Anybody remember that one? I, we came up with that. Like, what do you need to do? What, what does God want me to do? I remember our pastor go, what does God need you to do? 
And I'm going, I'm praying, God, what do you want me to do? And he goes, with all the stuff that needs to be done around here, you're asking God what needs to be done? And I'm, I said, well, I was just trying to, he goes, oh, shut up, you're stupid. And uh, I'm, I'm, my past was rough now. And, uh, and he said, Good, there's like 20 needs, fill it. So I'm in college, Bible college, and one of the courses I'm taking has a thing in there on children's ministry I got to take. So I take this course. And then they got to, they, they said, you have to go in and do children's ministry for a while. Get involved in the children's department. Now, that was like pulling teeth for me. And I, I thought, I don't want to go work with children. I'm going to work with, you know, somebody that can change the world, not change their diapers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't want to do that. And, uh, and, but uh, the, the, the thing did it. And I mean to tell you, so I signed up to go help in children's church. The thing like we have back there, ours wasn't quite as grand as you'll see in a minute. We didn't have worship leaders and sound systems and all these people coming in and helping and teaching with all this curriculum that was amazing. Because when I showed up, everybody else left. I'm dead serious. I showed up for Children's Church to help, and they went, help has arrived. And they ran like cockroaches when the light comes on. And uh, I mean, there was, Debbie was there with me. There was no one left. I, there's 60 kids, and I show up, or I don't know, maybe it was, well, it was probably that, 50, 40. It felt like 100. And uh, however many it was, it was way too many. I just know that. And I'm looking at them the first week, and so I stumbled through something. I'm literally, it was Debbie and me. Everybody left with these little kids. We'd never done it before. I had never served in a children's church before. I'd never been to one before. And I, and I thought, I'm going to figure this out. And so I built me a little stage, because it was just me. And, 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 and I saw Jimmy Dean with that sausage dog. Anybody remember Jimmy Dean and Ralph, how many of you, it was his name Ralph, wasn't Jimmy Dean's dog named Ralph? Ralph, he had that little, I had that puppet. You stick your hand in it. So I had Ralph, so I renamed him Dudley. I renamed him Dudley, and I built this little thing that I could stick my arm through, so it was a black curtain there, and I'd stand right beside it with my arm like this, and I would do the whole class, me and Dudley. And I would do his voice, you know, Dudley do right of the Mounties. And, uh, and I'd do this little thing, you know, remember Dudley do right of the Mounties? Anybody? That, you'd be over 100 if you remember that. And, uh, and, and so I'd do, and so, and, and I would let Dudley do all the bad work. And when a kid was misbehaving, Dudley would go, sit down, you idiot. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I didn't say that, Dudley did, you know what I'm saying? And uh, sorry, Dudley, wake up and be polite. Sorry. And, uh, and so I would just, I could rebuke kids and do the whole thing. I could teach whole Bible lessons. So I'd do whole Bible lessons. Me and Dudley would talk back and forth. And, and here's the thing, you're going, was it good? It was awful. <laughs> and uh, I mean, come on, a guy standing in front of a black curtain with his arm stuck up in it. And, but here's the little thing, the little kids were like, they fell in love with Dudley. And I'm going, he's on my arm. It, it, but they just fell in love with him. And so here, here's what I'm saying about serving. I, I, did I want to do that? Uh-uh. But I mean, here, here's the thing that happened. I started to want to do it because here's what happened. Serving took me to the next spot in my spiritual growth. I wasn't just fixing the church's problem. Because here's what happened. The little kids started coming up to me in the hallway at the church. They'd see me somewhere, and they'd come up, and they'd go, is Dudley coming today? <laughs> and, I mean, it was, they actually fell in love with that dumb little dog. And, uh, and, 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 so, and, I, and so, and I got excited about it. I started coming up with all kinds of scripts. I got all this stuff and started having fun with it. And actually, but here's what serving did. It gave me this little group of people who loved me. I had my first following. Now, they were all short and exceedingly broke. So you couldn't start a church with them or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I was going to change the world from here right now. But, man, I thought, look at this. If you serve people, you get all these people who love you. And God was going, son, now you're moving into the next level of discipleship. It's an attitude. And my attitude about being there changed. It wasn't, I did not pick. And you don't always get to pick. Well, it's funny, you get into something sometimes, you're going, I didn't think I was going, but man, this is, I feel great about this. I hear that all the time. I hear that all the time. You still with me? 
Here's what, read verse 26 again. He says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Where, in other words, read it differently. People go, I want to be with Jesus. Then what, what would this verse be saying to you? If you want to be with Jesus, then serve. Because serving is following. Everybody gets to this point where it has to happen. Every, it, it, serving will grow you where prayer won't. You can pray yourself three hours a day. You still, it won't do what serving will do. It won't, serving doesn't do what prayer does. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying we're going to graduate from prayer to serving. I'm saying they do different things. You can read your Bible through and through. You're still going to have to serve to grow in the area that God wants you to grow because God has called you here to serve people. It's just a thing we do. And, and so, and then I think our attitude, before we leave attitude, our attitude a lot of time about serving is determined by how we see being a servant. If it's just subservient, look up, there's the people with the real authority, there's the people with the real power, I'm just a servant here. Don't ever see serving as that way. God served. Jesus never diminished who he was as the King of kings and Lord of lords by taking on the form of a man. He became a servant, but he never became less God. You have to understand that. He didn't become less God when he be took on the form of a man. And so serving is just a way of using your authority and success to bless other people. Oh, gosh, there's so many things I want to say. And, um, but we'll talk more about that when I get to attitude. Now, aptitude. Aptitude I'm just going to talk about. for So you have to have the right attitude in serving. Then there's the aptitude of serving. Now, by definition, the word aptitude means basically a fit, you're, you're fit for it. It's fitness for the task, talent, a, you're suitable for it. You know, you're the right person for the job. There's an aptitude you have, an ability um, that's there. And we've all got certain abilities. And man, that's where you should start. You're going, how, how what, what should I do to serve? Well, start with this, whatever you know. Do, do what you can. You, if you learn certain things at work, if you know how to do certain things from your education, if you've been in church all your life and done all kinds of different things you know, in church that you said you're never going to do again, I need you to rethink that. I really do, especially if you're doing nothing. Because listen to me, if you're doing nothing, you've stalled your spiritual growth. So which one am I worried about today, getting more servants or your spiritual growth? You have to decide that. A lot of you have been with me for months, and a lot of you have been with me for years. You decide that. What's more important to me? You working or you growing? Just for the record, a hint. It's the second one. And if you don't serve, you don't grow. That's, you just don't. There's a point where that is the next step. And so, yeah, you all have abilities, and you use them. So <laughs> that's the first rule of stewardship. But then here's the other thing. Aptitude is something, is the ability to learn. So there's some things going, I don't know how to do that. We can teach you. I, I've watched Aaron train these families, and they're all good families. They probably could have figured it out, maybe. But they go in and they're trained. Here's what you say, here's how you do it. We look at how we can do it better, and we keep doing it until people are really, really good at going back there and teaching these kids. You can learn things. You can learn how to be a life group leader. You can learn how to be a greeter. You can learn how to be on the worship team. But you, you need to have some musical ability to even get started. Just want you to know. I have had people, I have only a few, but it's happened to me a few times when people said, I'm called to be up there. I said, well, let's hear you. And I heard them. And I said, did the devil call you? And uh, I said, who called you? I mean, like, you're like, I don't, I don't say that to him. I let Kurt do that. And, uh, and I said, Kurt, you got to get rid of them. They can't sing. I, I'm over there going, man, I love you. And, uh, and, and just let Kurt be the bad guy. And uh, that's his job. That's his cross to bear. Musicians that can't sing or play but think they're a rock star. That's part of every worship leader's curse. Just want you to know, if you can't sing, don't try. Go learn somewhere else. Now, if you can't play and you want to take lessons and pay for it, I have people all around here who need money. They'll help you. And everybody said, I just wanted you to hear that. All right, so that wasn't in the first service, so I, apparently there's people here with problems. 
But everybody can learn. You can develop skills. So if you're going, I don't know how to do that, but if I can help there, hey, I got the time. Can you teach me? Then we will. All right, everybody got, and then the third one is altitude. So you got to have a right attitude, you got to have an aptitude, and you got to have the right altitude. You got to understand serving is an elevated place in life, not a decreased one. You're not diminishing yourself to serve. And, um, and it, 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 by altitude, it's elevating service to a way of life in all things because it's the way of Jesus. Yes. Jesus served. He served. He, he, he didn't demand of people and say, listen, I'm God. Worship me, yeah. dumb disciples. He loved them and taught them and bore with them and stood with them and was patient with them. He served. And God, this world needs more servants. Yeah. It needs more servants. It, as soon as we see serving others as a way of life, as soon as you see it, you have basically cut the cords with narcissism and selfish behavior. That's great. And that's a part of our culture right now. It's, it's so deep in our culture. But when you decide, you know, I'm going to do this the way of life, selfishness and narcissism just lose their way. Because you just walk in a room and go, it's not about me, it's about who's here that I can help and bless. How can I come in here and make this party better? Amen. That's how believers should live. That's how I believe. Viktor Frankl was famous um, for his writings, and he was in uh, Nazi concentration camps as a Jew. And uh, he was in there with all the horrendous things that were happening around him and the dehumanization of all the people that were there, and it was pressing him in, and, I mean, he was caving. Uh, he, he was going under with all of the others that were thinking suicidal things, just get me out of here. It was so horrifying. That was sometimes the best thought you could have, I just want to die. And um, then he's written books since then. One of his, probably his most famous is Search for Significance. And, um, but he, he writes this one thing that's just a wonder to me. How he made it through the concentration camps, got to the other side, went out sane, and became a great influential thought think, uh, leader. H how in the world did he do it? He said this. Here, here's what he said. I changed the question from what do I want to what is being asked of me. So he sits in this room with all the horrendous things happening around him, the horrifying things that are happening to people and himself that he's experiencing, the total dehumanization of people. And he goes, God, I want out. I want them to die. I want freedom. I want justice. That's what I want. But that wasn't helping him because the behavior wouldn't leave. So if he sat there and thought, what do I want that I don't have? I'm going to basically go insane. I'm going to go into utter discouragement and lose all hope of life. He said, so what's being asked of me? And he heard. He looked around the room going, help that brother make it. Give that word, the brother an inspiring word. Just pray for them. Do this. Be used. Serve. And he said he took that way of life and lived it out in the concentration camp. And he said, that's how I survive. That's how I survive. Serving gives you meaning. Do you know everybody in here, you're born, you're born with a deep inner thing that wants you to be a contributor to the human race. Lost people have it. People that don't know Jesus. Inside their very nature is a desire to be a contributor to the human race. I don't have time to qualify with all the questions you have right now. Just know this. I've never met anybody. The weirdest of all people started with a desire to be a contributor to the human race. And as a believer, that doesn't go away. Right. It grows. Right. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to be a contributor to the human race, to be a contributor to the community, to be a contributor, a giver out of the surplus of God's bounty as it comes to you, is something we're called to be. Called to be. It's just in us. And when we begin to serve, it gives us dignity and a healthy self-worth. Take serving in the altitude. Take serving out of the menial. It isn't just doing, you know, the people say, Here, you know, I hear this a lot, and it's the right thing I use to say. Say, look, Pastor Russ, I'll do anything. I'll clean toilets around here. 
And it gets kind of a way, it's, it's, a, it's a, almost a euphemism, it's like a thing that you just say, because that's considered the lowest, right? But what if it's not? What if that doesn't make you any lower? What if the restroom needs to be cleaned so that others are in a better environment? You raise that up going, no, no, I'm, I'm not the lowly, lowly bathroom cleaner. I'm a servant of the Most High God, creating a better environment for all people here. That's another way of looking at it, and you have to elevate serving. And then I just have a note, because I don't have time to go into it, share this with the first, or share it with you. Just a note about marriage. There's several, not several, there's a few key secrets to a successful marriage. Really, I mean, you could do books and material, books are written, but I actually, Debbie and I have come to the opinion, there's just a few key things, maybe three or four. And if you do these, the rest of all that other stuff that's written about, as important as it is, it will get there. One of them, one of them is this. If you serving is the secret to a lifelong connection and intimacy in a marriage, both emotional and physical. Because what every couple wants is the right amount of emotional and physical connection. And I'm not, I don't have anything funny to say about any of that. It's just a fact. And, uh, and so that, that's what's wanted in marriage. You'll never get that without serving. Serving your mate. You say, well, my mate doesn't serve back. Well, that's their deal. But you are called to serve. And you serve. That doesn't mean you become a throw rug for them to walk on. I'm not saying any of that. I, I don't have time to qualify it, but just know this. One of the great secrets of a great marriage is a life of serving. Amen. Wanting the other to succeed and make them better. So it's so important. All right, now, I want to talk real quick about the enemies of serving. The enemies of serving. Well, you know, why people don't serve. So here's number one, encumbered. People, people are encumbered. You know, where the scriptures say, gird up your loins and run, Jesus says that. That's, that was a saying in those days for get rid of all the paraphernalia around you that restricts you from movement. So what a man would do, because they had those, like those robes, they had little hooks on them with ropes, and they, to gird them up was they would pull them, and they would come to like here so that they could run. And it, so they, they were unrestricted in their movement. So when the Bible says, gird up your loins, which is, a, you, don't, you don't hear people saying that much at work. Hey, brother, gird up your loins. You probably get hit. You know, just the wrong words, you know what I mean? Go, that just didn't fit right with me. And, uh, and, and so I hit him. And, uh, but it's, so... But, but so that's what it means to live in this unrestricted way because when you're called upon to serve, you got to have the time. Yeah. You got to have some discretionary time to do it. You got to be able to. You can't be so, so burdened down with your disordered chaos of a life that you can't move. And folks, a lot of people live that way. If I have any propensity in my past, I actually have come to be in this, I don't know what happened, something clicked in me and I became this hyper order person. But it wasn't until later in life. I really wished it had been sooner because you, it, it, it gives you so much more space to operate in if you're ordered. God is a God of order. I know a lot of people go, I like it sloppy. I like it spontaneous. Then you can tell it's God and not man. You know what? You can have all that you want because after about three of those sloppy services, everybody's saying the same thing because they don't have anything new to say because they haven't prepared to find something new to say. So they're just using emotional energy to gas you up one more time and you're calling it God. It ain't nothing but man. I like a little order. I mean, we're going to try to be done on time. Are you glad? Say amen. This is your chance. This is your chance to lead me. You want me to be done on time? Yeah, I know you do. <clears throat> Some people are just overcommitted. They just say yes to everything. And then they're good at nothing. They're literally good at nothing. They miss appointments. They forget. They're behind. They have to give up. They have to call and cancel. You ever notice they're overcommitted, but they never fulfill their commitments because they're overcommitted? You have to work to make yourself available for God. You've got to create some space for him. If you don't, you can't serve him. He has to have some time of your discretionary time. We realize that, my gosh, we know you're 
boss tells you what you do with your time during your work day. We don't tell you what to do with that. Then you have a family, so your mates and your children tell you what to do with that time. But there still should be time left over for Jesus. Amen. There should be. There's enough time. God didn't short us. That's right. Right. That's right. Second thing is an overreaction to past abuse. I won't stay here long. An overreaction to past abuse. Everybody's probably had a bad experience. And a lot of people, you'll, I get this one a lot over the almost, well, 47 years of ministry, I think, something like that, that I've heard this one a lot. You know, I, I tell you what, I was abused by a, a, an authoritarian leader who took advantage of me, didn't care about me, just ran me into the ground, just worked me and didn't care about me and just used me up. And I, I was sick of it. There was no, they didn't celebrate us right. And so I decided I'm never going to serve again. You know, and you hear that a lot. And you know what? It, it happens. It just does. Sometimes somebody out there just doesn't have their stuff together. They're not a good leader, and they take advantage of people. Anybody here been taken advantage of by a leader? Can I see your hand? It should be just about everybody. Just about all of us have been taken advantage by a leader. Because if you have a good heart, and you'll get out there and serve. Somebody will know it and take advantage of you. I mean, I was the youngest guy on our staff, and... At the, and I was hungry, and man, I, I wanted to learn anything, so I'd do anything. And as soon as they know you'll do anything, you do everything. Yeah. I'm dead serious. As soon as they know you'll do anything, then you'll be doing everything. And even the staff will be volunteering you for stuff. Because they didn't want to do it. Oh, Russ is good at that. Let him do it. Russ needs to learn that. Let him do it. I mean, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And I was the lowest salary on the staff. And there were times I thought, now this is a bit abusive. This is not right. I've told you, and I don't, I, it, it's, it's, I don't even know if I have time. It's been years since I told it here in church. Been, some of you have heard it five times because you've been here for 20 years. And, uh, but I didn't have time in the first service, but I, I took this job as a youth pastor for those who just laugh at the right places, for those of you who've heard it too many times. And, uh, and, uh, but I took this job as a youth pastor, and our pastor bought a Silver Eagle bus bought a Silver Eagle bus, a giant thing. He was so proud of it. Wrote the name of the church on it, put it out front where everybody was driving by, could see it. He was super proud of it. So we have a staff meeting. I got to go a little faster. We have a staff meeting, and he goes, I know I want that bus washed every week. Oh, well, that's no big deal. They got truck washes. You take them down there, drive them through there. And he says, so I'm going to buy a hose and a wand, and, uh, and we'll get you all the equipment, and people on staff are going to wash the bus every Friday. I want it clean on the weekend when people come to church. I want it to look good. A Silver Eagle bus. Now, that, that's no Volkswagen. That is a, that's some work right there. And, uh, and all of us as a staff went, oh, no. What in the world? And, um, and so he said, so which one of you guys will volunteer first? And I mean, we volunteered like in reverse. Like in reverse, like no one said a word. It was awful. If I was the leader of that church, I'd have fired everybody. I mean, literally no one. We, we sat there, zip, throw away the key. And uh, don't say a word. I'm waiting you out, pal. So we were all waiting each other out while our pastor's sitting there looking at us. And I mean, I could tell. I thought, oh, no. His face got red. He always had this crooked finger. It was, I don't know if he broke it when he was young or what. And, uh, but it was crooked, and it would come out. And his, he had like a jowl, like a rooster. And, um, and, and when he'd get mad, he would start to kind of quiver. And, um, and I thought, oh, no. Because if you'll do, any, if you'll do anything, then you will do... Uh. So I thought, I don't want to wash a stupid bus first. He can wash it first. The choir director doesn't ever do anything. Tell him to do it. And so I'm thinking about all the lazy people on the staff, and I hear it. I know what's coming. I know what's coming. And his finger comes out, and he goes, Russ! He's so mad, he screamed. He goes, Russ! I go, yes, sir. He goes, you will wash the bus on Friday. You understand me? You! And I went, clearly do I understand I'm washing the bus. And I was so mad. He bought me hoses, a wand, those things that spin. And they got me some special soap for it. Got me buckets. Bought it all. Sat it out there. And I remember walking out to wash that bus. I was so mad. I saw one of the staff members. I seriously, this is like the devil sitting at his desk with his feet up on his desk talking on the phone while I'm walking by 
in, with my, and I, those days we wore nice clothes during the week. You had to. I, I, and, and so I had on dress pants. So I had rolled them up, had them all rolled up so I didn't wreck them. And, and, uh, and, and I'm looking at them. I thought, if I could get this wand inside that window, I'd wash your face right now, pal. I was so mad. I was so mad at this guy. And, uh, and, and so I go out and I'm just the whole time, I'm complaining washing this bus. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm barely doing it right. You know when, you're, when your attitude and your altitude is not right, serving goes bad. Excellence isn't a part of the game. And I was missing spots. Uh, no one's even looking. It's dumb. No one even looks at this bus. He loves the bus. People don't love the bus. I had all these things going on inside me. I don't even love the bus. It's a bus. It's even a used bus, for crying out loud. So I'm washing the thing. I'm going, I mean, just all kinds of negativity. Now, I had heard the Lord's voice in this way a few times in my life, and so when I heard it, I knew it. So I have to finish this story. I hear the Lord say to me, and many of you have heard this, because it's a story that's a marker in my life. It's a marker in my life. And uh, I hear the Lord go, put the hose down, put it away, and go home. You're done. And I stopped because I knew it was the Lord, and I, and I knew I was supposed to keep listening. You know, when you hear God like that, you don't go, okay. You keep listening. So I, because it was so clear. And I don't hear the Lord clearly like that. To this day, I don't hear him like that that often. This was a marker in Russ Austin's life. That's why this story is so important to me and why I've told it I don't know how many times. And I said, I, go home. He goes, you're done. If you want out of the ministry, go home. I'll let you go. Uh, and I, and I'm, so I'm sitting there and, and praying out loud. I go, God, I don't, I don't want out of the ministry. I just didn't want to wash the bus. I, I'm the next Moses. I, I, I'm a youth pastor. That I'm going to take a youth group and set them on fire. We're going to change the world. I got the tablets in my car. I, I, I'm telling you, we can, I can, that's what I thought I was called here to do. And he said, just go home. If you don't want to wash the bus, go home. So I knew. And, and then I said, Lord, I don't know what you're trying to say to me. And he goes, your, your pastor just had to basically beg somebody on your team to go do a job, and you made his life miserable. I didn't call you to the youth. I called you to this church and him. Now, I'm not trying to get anybody to do that to me. That's not what I'm saying. It was something I needed to know. He said, if he's not succeeding, you're not succeeding. So make sure he's succeeding. It wasn't like I needed to go wipe his feet. or God wasn't telling me that. He was saying, there was a need, son. And you just walked away from it. You're mad about filling a need. Go home. You won't be good in the ministry. And I mean, I said, hold on. Now, I always get teared up here, but I said, hold on. I went and turned my water on, fired my wand up, and I made that sucker look like a brand new bus. All right, now, here's the thing. Here's what I, in the next staff meeting, Pastor Albritton goes, I need somebody to wash the bus. Russ did it last week. I said, hold on. I said, I get it every Friday. He said, oh, no, you don't have to do that. I said, no, no, I want to walk. Don't ever worry about it again. And in my mind, I'm going, God talks to me out there. I might meet him out there again. See, when you follow Jesus and you serve, He's there. He's there. Not, did I ever want to wash the bus? No. Was I ever having joy washing the bus? Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Elevate serving. Grow in your aptitude and have the right altitude or attitude. And it changed my life. And I saw serving different from then on. I saw serving as what God said. I'm going to use it to meet you, Russ. Not just to make them better. I'm going to meet you. Yes. Hallelujah. God. Everybody's still here. Yes. So you can have an overreaction to past abuse. So I just want to say this. So maybe that was abusive. I don't know. 
But I just want to say this. How long will what happened to you be greater than what God wants to do in you and with you? Okay, so true abuse. I've got to say this. We've got to hustle here. True abuse happens, and it's hurtful, and it's traumatic. I, I acknowledge that. And it needs time to recover from. There's mourning and grieving, replacement of lies that come in in those moments with truth, getting undergirded again, getting your foundation built again. When you're hurt like that, there's something lost in you. And you have to rebuild that. You just don't come breaking out going, I'm a man of faith. That didn't even happen to me. It's like it never even happened. That's stupid. I don't even believe you. But also at the other end, there's a time limit. At some point, you've got to be looking at yourself. I should be over this by now. That is still telling me who I am, not what God's telling me who I am. My best abuse is, to make, is defining me, not what God wants me to be. So somewhere I've got to make a break with this. Anybody, whatever abuse it is, you go, Russ, you're cold. I'm not cold. I love you to pieces. I don't want you to be trapped in what happened to you any more than you have to be. I want you to get out and have victory, to win, to walk past it, call it your testimony, remember it, and tell others how great God is in who he's made you to be in spite of what the devil tried to do to you. That's what I want. I love you more than the person who says, it's okay for you to stay like that as long as you want. You don't get to. And the last one's entitlement. Entitlement's the spirit of our age. It's the spirit of our age. It's, a, it's the pervading thought that we're owed something that we didn't work for and didn't pay for. I don't know where that came from. Where did that come from? Where is it we thought we were owed something? I got some ideas because of the way kids are raised and stuff like that now, but I have some ideas. You know, you're raised that way, so you just kind of think the world's that way. But no one owes you anything. No, no one owes you anything. You, you can't go into the world thinking that way. I see this in church. Sometimes. You know like a restaurant? You know, in a restaurant, you know, when you go in and, and you order your meal and you see on the thing, on the column there, it's this much for this meal. And then you know serving isn't counted in there. So the server gets a percentage of money or so, as you choose, to tip for their good service. So there's the price of the food, and then there's left to you to choose how much you tip. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. But with this new thing is something where they come out and go, hey, here's something you could think about tipping. Have you had anybody do that to you? They turn the screen around and go, and it starts like at 18%. And I'm going, okay, that's, I'm actually happy to do that. I just want 18% of your labor. I don't owe you a tip. You work for it. Right? I know you don't want to say that. In our world today, oh, no. Don't say this. Sensitive souls. Well, get over it. I mean, many times I'm going, I look at Debbie and going, I, I only because I'm a pastor, I know they'll use my name. But I'm going to tell you what, they're about a 9%. They ain't filled my water. They're rude as heck, and they haven't been back to even know if I'm still here. But they want 18%. Because it's become expected without earning it. And, I, and so that whole thing's in our culture. So take it and turn it around, flip-flop it, because here's the thought that can enter your mind. I don't think a lot of people have it, but some do. Here's what it is. Hey, look, I pay my tithe here. I, I pay for certain things, so I expect certain things. All right, it just happens. When people give... Then they, you know, and, and they give, and then there are certain things they expect as givers. Now, here's the thing. We want to give to you whether you give or not. If serving is a way of Jesus, then we're going to serve you whether you give or not. We're not going to go, hey, we'll give to you because you serve, or give, or serve you because you give and not serve you because you don't give. First, we don't know who you are. And then the second thing is we've never do operate that way. We live to serve. We build people by serving. We don't do it because you tithe. I'm not doing this because somebody pays money. Nobody's earned this. Your tithe is your worship and obedience to the Almighty God. It's not buying something. It's serving God with worship. We're not entitled to anything because we do certain things. People say, I give a lot of money. I say, well, you make a lot of money. And they say, well, but I still, I give a lot of money. I say, well, you make a lot of money. If you make a lot of money, you give a lot of money. The widow just gave two pennies, but she didn't make much money. 
The Bible says she gave more than you. So sometimes entitlement gets in the way. All right. One last thought on that. The opposite of entitlement is gratitude. So if you come to church and you're grateful for your salvation, you look around this house and go, what needs to be done? How can I make this people great? It's gratitude. All right. I'm going to finish this story with a paragraph or this sermon with a paragraph and, um, and uh, uh, a short story about a man in history. Uh, this paragraph's too long for me to read just without you looking, so I'm going to put it on the screen. It's a paragraph by George Bernard Shaw. This is the true joy in life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I'm of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a sort of a splendid torch which I got to hold up for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Isn't that great? Man, what a way to live. What a way to think. David Brainerd, uh, that Pastor Ryan talked about in one of his prayer teachings, I think he might have done it on a Sunday, um, says this about his life. Let me make a difference for you that is utterly disproportionate to who I am. Just remember that when I said that, and I want to tell you one last story, and we'll close. John Woolman. How many of you have heard of John Woolman? Can anybody, John Woolman, anybody know him? It's funny, I, I couldn't believe that I'd never heard of him. I hadn't either. So, John Woolman uh, lived in 1754, uh, published some books that were very well known then, or a book that was very well known then. And, um, uh, and he was uh, a merchant, and, and he also did some law. And listen to some things about John Woolman, because slave trade was a big deal then. I mean, every... And, and he was a Quaker. Oh, I meant to say he was a Quaker, which was a religious movement that actually was a great religious movement. Had some issues, but they were amazing and helped the world be a better place. And, uh, and he was one of the Quakers. But here, listen to his practice of law. He, he continued to refuse to draw up wills that bequeathed ownership of slaves to heirs. Over time, and working on a personal level, he individually convinced many Quaker slave owners to free their slaves. And then he would travel, and I'm going to shorten this a bit, he would travel and speak, and when he would go and stay with the people, he was a speaker, he was a kind of a minister too. He was a merchant, and uh, did law, and then was, uh, would speak in churches in what they called um, their friendship, their gathering of friends, that's what they were called. And um, he, he, listen to what he did when he traveled. When he accepted hospitality from a slaveholder, he insisted on paying the slaves for their work in attending him. He refused to be served with silver cups, plates, and utensils as he believed that slaves in other regions were forced to dig such precious minerals and gems for the rich. He observed that some owners used the labor of their slaves to enjoy lives of ease, which he found to be the worst situation not only for the slaves, but for the moral and spiritual condition of the owners. He could condone those owners who treated their slaves gently or worked along beside them. In other words, were brothers. So he moved into speaking, and to bring this to a close on his life, and speaking and went for years, years he would go and go, as a Quaker, the Bible is clear, you can't have a slave, you gotta stop this. He would go to meeting, to meeting, to meeting, and speak with great conviction. Did it as a servant, served. You don't ever hear about him, but he was the beginning of all of the anti-slave movement that came out of England and then to North America. John Woman. I don't know why we never hear about him. Listen to this. The Quaker records bear witness to his and a few others' success by the time of 1776 to 1783, after the Revolutionary War was over. Almost all North American Quakers had freed their slaves, and those few Quakers who had been engaged in the trading or shipment of slaves had ceased such activities as well. One man. One man who said, I see, I'm going to serve this. I'm giving my life to this no matter what it costs me. 
I'm going to fight this to the bitter end. And he got an entire movement to turn. And that was the beginning of all of the anti-slave mentality and philosophy that came into North America. Just a servant. A guy who made a disproportionate difference to who he was. God used him. Now, I finish with this. South Point Community Church is built with people that had Shaw's attitude. They don't want to be a clod of ailments and <laughs> that's a funny little saying. And they, they don't want to just complain about what the world's not doing for them. We have these people here. We've had people here over 20 years. We'll be 25 years old in February that have served and given. And not just once or twice and not just for a season. They literally been working for years to make this place what it is. They have that mentality. I want to make a difference. They got a torch going burn brightly and I want to hand something off to the next generation that's powerful. They, they have a thing, they have this thing and mentality in them. Yeah, I see it in bunches of them. I could go all around this room right now and point fingers at you and name your names. They've held this torch up and go, we're going to hand something powerful to the next generation. And they're, and they're, like, <laughs> they're like Brainerd. They go, use me, oh God, and make me disproportionate to who I am. Use me in a greater way than anything that I've ever been. And I, I have these people all over this place. South Point Community Church is not Russ Austin and the few staff members who work here. South Point Community Church is all those people. It doesn't happen without them. And they have done it year in, year out, year in, year out, year in, year out, and made this place what it is. And I actually think it's a really, really great church. There's a lot of love here. There's a lot of serving here. You find your people here. Our people have come back from Mexico. Mexico. It's funny listening to all their stories. They buried vans in the stand, sand. They got pulled over by the police. They got hurt and couldn't find stuff to fix themselves. I've listened to all the stories. I was in this van. I was in that van. And, and, all, and they've all got the little communities of faith that they've been building with each other. And that's funny. When you go serve together, you build your family together. It's the way it works. That's what's happened for a lot of us. We've just served together. We've just been building together. Next thing you know, we're just family. Couldn't think of not being with each other. It just you, You're going, where else would I be? It's more than my church now. It's become my people. It's become what I do for Jesus. It's the torch that I've held up. I've put so much into this thing. I've poured so much of my life into it. I want it to succeed and grow so I can hand something powerful off to another generation. Those people make South Point Community Church what it is. You're amazing. You're not entitled. You might be encumbered, but you just add to it to make it grow. And so today, I just wonder if a bunch of you would join us that don't serve. It is one of those sermons. I make no apology. I haven't done one of these in, I don't think, 10 years like this. But are you serving? Do you serve here? Is there some bit of your discretionary time? Take that blue card. And look at it, because here's the altar call. And the, really the one that got us all started on this, and I didn't do this right in the first service, and I deeply apologize to those who were dependent on me. But really this all started, if you'd fold your card, just like that. Fold it right there on number two, so you can't see anything but number one. That's where we need the most help because of what we're doing and the way we're doing it now. Because if we don't fight for our children in a different way, the world gets them all. The battle has been escalated to something that's mind boggling to me. So we have to go to work. You say, Russ, I'd rather have a tooth pulled than work in the children's department. That was me. Get you a puppet and get in there. No, you don't even have to do that. We'll train you. We'll teach you. Yes. We'll show you. But we have to be a church who sees our children as somebody under attack. And the one way we can help is serve the heck out of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. So I hope a bunch of you would say, I'm going to sign up for the children's ministry. All right. Now, Kaylee's here, so she'll go, what happened? Now, number four, everybody wants to be in. We have more help there than we can shake a stick at. So you go, I want to do youth. If you felt called to youth, I'm sure you feel called to children. 
No, I'm serious. I know why you feel called to youth, so be called to children and create great youth. Create great youth. But there's also greeters and ushers, and you can look in the card, you can see it, and then you turn your card over and go, you know, I'm not serving. And it says, I mean, we made it about easy. A lot of these are once a month for crying out loud. And I know, because some of you, the reason we put that on there, because I know some of you are going, it's like the mafia. If you sign up for something, you can never get out. <laughs> They'll do a guilt trip on you, and you can never quit. You know, your whole life will be gone. You'll never, you'll never hear another sermon again. All you'll see is crying babies. <laughs> we put in there that low commitment of some discretionary time. And there's other things. We couldn't put everything on here. And in the security team, I said in the first service, hey, what guy doesn't want to look like a CIA agent carrying a gun? And Doug goes, no. He yelled out, no guns. I go, okay, no guns then. And uh, so you, you can't carry a gun if you're on the security team unless Doug tells you you can't. But there's fatalities. You can come up and work once in a while with Kirk and do things. Folks, serving is a way of life, but it's also how the house of God is built. And so, would you, if you're not serving, consider serving somewhere and see what Jesus does with it. Amen. I would have never thought Mina, brown dog, <laughs> would become one of the richest moments of my entire career. I thought I did it. Debbie's out there monitoring, <laughs> keeping them all under order, and I'm out there. <laughs> and it worked. It taught me something that I've never forgotten. If there's nothing to do and you serve in faith, I mean, if there's no one, can, there's a big problem, just serve in faith, see what God does. God meets the humble heart of a servant and does more through you than you could ever dream. Praise God. Amen. So sign the card and put it in the box on your way out. And here's the thing, we have set up serving central, and so I'll stop now. We've set up Serving Central out there. There's a set of tables. There'll be people out there going, I need to ask a question when you say a greeter or an usher. Or, and, or maybe you thought of something that you've done in a church before that you'd like to do and, uh, and help with. And you sign that card and drop it in the boxes on your way out. And, um, and if you have questions about some area, we've set it all up. People are back there. Go over to Serving Central and go, now how often, what, how, could I quit after six months? Or all that stuff that you want to ask, go over to that table and ask. Everybody good? Serving is a way of life. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Father God, bless our church with more and more and more great servants that look like you. Because Jacksonville needs people that look like you. They need to come find people that look like you. They want it so desperately, even though they don't know it. That's what they need. And I pray that you will move on people's hearts all across this room to go, I will help. I will help. Move in their heart. Help them hear your voice. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. All right, we're going to receive the Sunday morning tithes and offerings, so if you'll prepare yourself to give, which is a way of serving, and um, we would appreciate that so much. The three ways to give are to text South Point CC to 77977. You can use the envelope in the chair in front of you for check or cash, drop it in the black box on the way out. The app always works. We want everybody to have the app. You can use the app, go to the giving. If you're online, you go into the chat box and give and so and you should if you're watching this you should give and um, so we appreciate all of your faithfulness Jason's going to come up and give you a couple of announcements here after I pray and then we'll get you on your way home everybody good Amen. father I pray for your favor on every giver right now that Lord God as they give it'll be multiplied to meet every need and that father you'll bless every giver by throwing open the windows of heaven and pouring them out a blessing that they can't contain God, that they will be blessed beyond their wildest imaginations as they serve you in the act of giving. Bless it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Wasn't that an amazing word today? Thank you so much, Pastor, for that. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Welcome to South Point. So glad that you were here. We would love to invite you to share the service. Maybe you know someone who, uh, who needs to hear that uh, message. or we, uh, we, lot, we stream live on Facebook and YouTube, so thank you for doing that every week. But inside every seat also is a Connect card. So if you can go ahead and pull that out. If you're a regular tender or a member, thank you so much for doing that every week, letting, letting us know that you are here. 
Uh, but if you're new here, we would love for you to fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. We want to connect you to the life that God has for you here at South Point Community Church. And so we do that through the Connect card. We'll call you next week, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, you can also text my SEC to the number 484848. We'll send you a text link. You can fill it out on your mobile device uh, as well. One of the best next steps uh, that you could take here at South Point is our Grow Track. It's the well, Grow Track happens after the service. Uh, for the first four Sundays of a, or Sundays every month. Uh, today we're talking about belong. So today you're going to learn, learn the history of South Point, how you can get connected to this spiritual family. So an amazing class starts right after the service. So as soon as we're over, go ahead and go out, turn to the right and go up the stairs. And, and well, Pastor Ryan will uh, be teaching the class today. But it is the jumping point off to everything here at South Point. And like Pastor Russ said, even if you've been coming here for a while, if you've never been to Grow Track, you need to go check it out. It's a fantastic way to get connected here uh, at South Point. Also, we have th a couple things. Tomorrow, SEC Kids Camp starts tomorrow morning, so there's still time to sign up for that. So we would love for it to, if you have kids, uh, I think it's uh, through kindergarten through fifth grade, come drop your kids off here with us for the next three mornings. They're going to have the time of their lives. They're going to learn about Jesus in a very creative way. It's going to be amazing. Also, if you are, are a middle school and a high school uh, young man and your dad, it's still time to sign up for our Band of Brothers mountain trip. We leave tomorrow morning uh, at 8 a.m. is when we're going to sign up there, but the, you still spots. Go ahead and go to our app our website. Uh, you'll see it right there. Sign up there. It's not too late. Jump in. It's going to be an amazing, amazing trip. And just want to remind everyone that next Sunday on Father's Day is our baptism Sunday. And so if you've given your life to Christ and have never uh, been water baptized, we want to invite you to sign up for that. We want to celebrate what God is doing in your life with you. Uh, so do that on our uh, website and our app as well. Go ahead and stand and I'll pray of you. Let God bless you this week. As you go out, summer is here. Go ahead and raise your hands for me. Thank you, God, for these amazing people. God, thank you for that word. Thank you that you saved us by serving. You came to serve, gave your life for us. And God, I just pray a blessing over this great people, God, that they would be empowered by your spirit to go out into the world in which they live, work, and play and serve. God, that they would bring the light into the dark places, Lord God. They'd bring the love of Christ wherever they go that people's lives would change just because they met them. Lord God, we thank you for what you've done for us, and we will go serve you by serving others. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are amazing. We'll see you outside.